and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. The Internet has made it very, very easy to Google something and pull up information, some of it true, some of it false, some of it convoluted, and you can't figure out which way is up. But one of the mistakes that many Bible preachers or Bible teachers make is they apply the same definition to a word every time that they see it in the Bible. And that will cause a lot, a lot of error. There, God is very specific when he writes his word. I think we can all agree to that. And there is an intended diversity of meaning. Because God wants us to understand the context of a passage. And anybody that studied the Bible for any length of time understands that one of the first things of context is, well, who is being spoken to? And that context will help bring to life who the intended and specific meaning of that passage of Scripture is for. So the first point tonight within the first point, is that God has a very intended diversity of meaning when a word shows up. We cannot apply the same definition just because a word pops up. There is a common meaning. For example, the word salvation we see show up in the Bible, and the common meaning of the word salvation, it just means to be delivered. Every time that the word salvation shows up, we can apply that common meaning. We see salvation. We know it means to be delivered. That's the common meaning. But there is also a contextual meaning. And this is where it's going to specify. When you have a contextual meaning, that is never going to contradict the common meaning. Example, when salvation shows up, you can bank it that it means to be delivered. That's the common meaning. But now we are going to get some context and understand who is being delivered. And these specifics of who will help us deal with how to apply it biblically. There's spiritual salvation in the Bible. There's physical salvation in the Bible. We, we did some messages on that. And both of them mean to be delivered. Get 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. And we have one verse. And we have two different meanings of the same word <laughs> in one verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse number 10, the Bible says, who delivered us from so great a death. Well, isn't that great? He's delivered us. Have you been delivered? Mm -hmm. Great. Amen. And doth deliver in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. Well, wait a minute. I thought I was delivered. <laughs> you've got something spiritual and now you've got something physical. Was Paul delivered? Yes. After Paul was delivered, was he delivered? <laughs> yes. He went through a lot of stuff the Lord delivered him from, didn't he? Second Peter 2, the Bible says, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations. Wait a minute. I thought we were delivered. Yeah, you were. Your sins have been paid for, God, so you're safe. But there's also a deliverance or a salvation that God will provide in other words, to be delivered out of temptation. Does that make sense so far? Yeah. Okay. So a diversity of meaning, a common meaning, and then a contextual meaning all have to be taken into play in order for us to rightly divide the word. The word gospel. What's the common meaning of that? It means the good news or good tidings. Go to Matthew chapter number four. Matthew chapter number four is the first time that the word gospel shows up in the Bible. Let's read it. Matthew chapter 4, verse number 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel 
of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Now, is that the first time the word gospel shows up in the Bible? Yes, but it's not the first time that the, this gospel is referred to. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, uh, uh, let, go to Matthew, uh, go to Romans chapter 10, and I'll show you what I mean. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Watch this. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Do you know that the Old Testament refers to the gospel that we see here in Romans chapter 10? Let's turn back in our Bible and let, let's look at, well, first, Look, look, look here, look here. You've got the gospel in Romans 10, right? Verse 15. Before the word, the gospel, you have as it is written. Now, why in the world would as it is written be put in the middle of verse number 15 in Romans chapter 10? Anybody know why? As it is written, would refer back to what? Where it's written. Where it's written. Where it is written. And it was written in the Old Testament. So we're going to allow the Bible to define the Bible. So go back in your Bible to Isaiah. You'll have Ecclesiastes. You'll have Song of Solomon. And then you'll come to the book of Isaiah. And Isaiah chapter number 52, verse number seven says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings and publisheth peace. That bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth, there it is, salvation. That saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. You see that? There's our cross reference. Nahum, let's continue to flip forward in our Bible towards the New Testament. And you'll go Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, and then you'll come to Nahum. Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, and then Nahum chapter 1, verse number 15. Behold. Upon the mountains, the feet of him that bringeth good tidings that publisheth peace. O Judah, keep thy solemn feast, perform thy vows, for the wicked shall no more pass through thee. He is utterly cut off. The New Testament in Romans chapter 10 tells us that Isaiah. And Nahum, back in the Old Testament, were both referring to the gospel. And the word directly connects to the phrase good tidings or glad tidings. Children can see that and understand it, right? Good tidings, glad tidings. Roman ten, Romans chapter 10 shows us. The intended definition that we saw in Isaiah. You don't have to turn there, but Isaiah 61, verse 1 The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. What's good tidings? The gospel, because the gospel, the common definition, the broad definition means good tidings, glad tidings. Well, you say that's pretty, that's pretty. I mean, I know that. <laughs> that's pretty simple. It is. 
But approaching the Bible this way allows us to be able to piece things together correctly. And we have to do this. Do you know why? Because there are various meanings of the word gospel in our Bible. And every time you read or see the word gospel, it doesn't refer to the exact same thing. Will it refer to the common meaning of to be delivered? Yes. Let's look at a few. Matthew 4. We're not going to do a deep dive into any of these passages. We're going to focus on the gospel of the kingdom tonight. So I want to run through these quickly just to show you Matthew chapter 4, verse number 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. That's one gospel, gospel of the kingdom. Now get Acts. We were there this morning at one point. Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, verse 24. But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. What was happening in Acts 20, that gospel was not the same gospel that we just looked at in Matthew chapter 4. Do they both mean delivered? You bet they do. But there's some different, different meanings. Uh, Galatians 3, we have the gospel unto Abraham. Uh, let's go over to uh, Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter number 4. Uh, we see in uh, Hebrews 3, in, in, in verse number 2, Moses was faithful in all his house. We see in chapter 5, uh, verse number 5, Moses verily was faithful in all his house. Uh, verse no, uh, number 8, we see in the day of temptation in the wilderness. And it goes on, uh, verse 16, uh, howbeit not all came out of Egypt by Moses. And then we get to chapter number 4. In verse number 2, it says, for unto us was the gospel preached. As well as unto them. Do you think in the wilderness the same gospel was being preached as it is now for New Testaments? Christians? No. When we see the word gospel, we know that there's a common meaning of to be delivered or deliverance. But we need to ask ourselves who is being delivered. Last one. Um, and again, we're not doing a deep dive on these verses. Just wanting to show throughout the Bible that gospel shows up. It's not the same audience. Revelation chapter 14, verse number six. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven. Having the everlasting gospel. Huh. To preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Well, what's the gospel? What's this everlasting gospel that's going to be preached? Well, I'll preach it right now. Verse number say, seven. Saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of the water. There followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, the great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of her wrath and her fornication. And then you got a third angel. As comical as that might be to stand out in the street corner and do that. We're not preaching that gospel. We're preaching Rome, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 15. But in every single instance that gospel shows up, we do have mark it down, glad tidings, and good news. But the details and the specifics are found within the context. We have to be willing to leave our comfort zones to be able to look at the Bible through the Bible's lens and run these verses. And I mean, we could say, well, that's just boring. It's exciting when you get into the Bible. 
give it a chance. And some people, well, I, I've not heard that before. Well, you might be hearing it now, and now check it out, run the verses, but we can't stay in our doctrinal comfort zones because that's safe. You know, a boy, when I was a young boy, I got beat up pretty bad. And I was playing with other boys in, in, in the development we lived in, and uh, we were playing street hockey. And so I can grow up and I can be a dad. And when my son says, uh, Dad, can I go and play hockey with some of the kids from the development? I can say, no, you need to be fearful of everybody because, you know, I got beat up. And, and you, you can it. Or I can say, you know what, let's learn how to deal with this. Let's understand what could happen. Let's prepare ourselves. Let's people just do things because that's what they've always done. We've got to be re ready and willing to give up our tradition or what we've been taught to be able to move on and improve. It's the same story of the, you know, the, the mom who daughter asks her mom, why do you keep cutting the ends of the ham off before you cook it? And she says, I don't know. I've always done it that way. Well, why do you do it, though? Is there a reason? And the mom didn't know. So she figured I'll ask my mom and she didn't know. So her mom asked her mom and she said, oh, well, that's easy. Our stove was very small and we couldn't fit the ham in. So we had to cut the ends off for it to go in to cook it. And it finally got back to the great granddaughter. And she's like, oh, well, we don't have to cut the ends off anymore, do we? No, you don't. <laughs> We got to be willing to change position and not just stick into our doctrinal lane if we see something in the Bible that makes sense. And does Paul give us a warning in Galatians 1? Remember we did that message on the five Gospels, and the first one we talked about was Galatians, which says there's another gospel, but there should be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you other than what we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. I'm afraid of that. <laughs> I don't want to go out and preach something that I ought not preach. And I can see why people would be fearful about hearing a message on the varying differences of the gospel, because no Christian, a real I mean, a real Bible believing saved by grace Christian does not want to fall under this accursed gospel. Now, these people preaching the worst works-based salvation, they're already accursed. Because it ain't true salvation. They're not Christians. They might have some Christian things in their life. They might be moral people and follow some things in the Bible, which give me that as a neighbor any day of the week. But they're not saved. They're not saved. We can't be afraid to go against what we've been taught or even the religious majority. And if we deny that there's multiple gospels in the Bible, we're denying the truth of the Bible because we can see different messages were preached throughout different times in history. We can't be afraid that our denomination is going to reject us. We have to preach the Bible and all of the Bible. And I know I'm giving some warnings and disclosures here, but I have to do that because people are afraid to teach through the Bible because as soon as you get off salvation, which, yeah, we do, you know, like this morning, we had some salvation in there. But by and large, you don't hear me preach salvation every Sunday, although there will be salvation calls in the message. Because we're trying to teach all the Bible. <laughs> if everybody's saved, well, let's teach some other stuff. We can't be afraid to get away from salvation messages, which we should be bringing out to the world, by the way. And then messages on tithing and, and giving and, and all of that. We've got to be able to go through all of the Bible. Um, in Galatians chapter 3, Well, let's go there. Let's go there.
we won't stay long here because we have already been going through Galatians. So Galatians chapter three, verse eight. Uh, let's let's back it up. Uh, verse six, even as Abraham believed God and it was counted accounted to him for righteousness. Know you therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. How are we of Abraham? We don't have his physical blood. But our righteousness is imputed to us the same way Abraham's righteousness was imputed to him. He believed God. Have you believed God? Then by faith, we are the children of Abraham. We're already preached all that. You guys know all that. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith. Preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. And we talked about this before, so I'll briefly touch on it. Was Abraham justified by faith or was Abraham justified by works? Both. He was justified by works before God. No, no, no. Before man. He was justified by faith before who? God. Both are there. When somebody brings you to passages and talks about Abraham being justified by works, they are correct. If they apply them to salvation, they are incorrect. Abraham was justified before God by faith, before man by works. Guess how you're justified before man? By your works. James 2. No one's believing the fact of your testimony if you live like the devil. Nobody's going to believe you. Well, I think they should. You see, you're trying to justify yourself before man. You don't have any works to back up what you're saying, man. You are justified before man by works. Are you justified by works before God? No, no, no. You're justified before God by faith. We all get that. But this this in thee all nations shall be blessed. Abraham has a spiritual seed and he has a physical seed. In thee all nations be blessed. That gospel there, that defines what that good tiding would be. That's pretty good news, isn't it? In thee all nations shall be blessed. The truth of multiple gospels or multiple good or glad tidings, is re- it really is foreign to most Bible teachers or preachers. Every single one of these gospels requires a simple response of faith faith and matthew chapter 24 the gospel of the kingdom we can't allow what a seminary or a college or a youtube preacher or a denomination or a demonation whatever you want to call it you can't and i can't Allow somebody that we like or organization that we like to trump the Bible. You can't do that with me. You can't do that with anybody. I've got favorite preachers. You've got favorite preachers. I've got favorite authors. You have favorite authors. But but Lord helping us, shouldn't we fall in love with this author? <laughs> and we should. So we need to keep that in the back of our mind. Um. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, study to show thyself approved. And if you just listen to me preach and you don't study the Bible, you're not following God. And if you just listen to somebody on the Internet or you just listen to I, when people get into something, if somebody's into government stuff, I can tell you right away who, who they're listening. If they would just get off government stuff for a while and kind of read and research and the the Bible and study that, they might come to some different conclusions. 
Look, I'm not telling you I don't have my favorite preachers. But we have got to be able to study the Bible. I'll tell you, my, my pastor's my favorite preacher. I, I've learned a lot from him. I'm, I'm thankful for him. But when somebody finds out who my pastor is, I got to tell them, look, I do my own Bible study. I love my pastor, but I study to show myself approved unto God. So don't listen to me in light of what you think I'm going to say because of who my pastor is. Does that make sense? You have to have respect of God's word and study his word. So what is this gospel of the kingdom? I'm going to give you some deep theology. It's a prepositional phrase. And it's using to clarify a group uh, it, what this gospel is. What's the preposition of? What's the modifier? The. What's the noun? Kingdom. <laughs> So it's the gospel of the kingdom. Who rules a kingdom? This is deep, kids. Who rules a kingdom? King. A king. That would be a king. And this gospel of the kingdom, it was very much emphasized when Jesus Christ was walking around on the earth during his earthly ministry. And it, re, and it re specifically refers to these glad tidings of this kingdom to which Jesus was referring to. In Luke 16, well, well, let's do this. Let's get Mark 1 instead. I think that'll be a better spot. Let's get Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, verse number 14. Now, after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. You know what this good news was? This kingdom's at hand. You know what men need to do? They need to repent and believe to enter into this kingdom. You get into Matthew 5. Let's go over to Matthew 5. We'll just look at it right quick. We'll read the whole thing. Um, man's responsibility and then the benefits of man obeying. But one verse in here, whosoever therefore, verse 19 Matthew 5, 19, therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. And whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. All throughout Matthew. This kingdom of heaven gospel, this glad tidings is news it's good news about the nature of this kingdom matthew 13 let me give you some examples let's go through matthew's a little bit of a survey in matthew 13 you got 58 verses we won't read them all but look at verse number three Behold, a sower went forth to sow. Look at verse number 24. The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. These are earthly events and earthly practices. This nature of this kingdom is all earthly in nature. Go to Matthew chapter 18. We'll see it again. Matthew 18. And verse number 23, watch this. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And so now go ahead and, and Jesus brings it all the way down to the end of the chapter with this likening of another earthly king and earthly practices. Matthew 20. For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, 
which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. What do we say? He, see here again, an earthly event. A man who's a household. Look at Matthew 22. All of these parables in Matthew are likened to these events going on on the earth. Matthew 22, verse number two. Look, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son. Another example. Look at Matthew all the way to 25. Verse number one. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. All of these practices, all of these situations that are going on, they're all likened to earthly situations that happen. And then Jesus brings forth the parable. What else is very, very key in understanding this kingdom of heaven? And that it was always confirmed by what? Close. It was always confirmed by signs. There's always signs involved. Signs, wonders, and healings. Let's look at it in Matthew 4. Watch. Matthew 4. Trying to get a deep dive on the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 4, 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Now, he couldn't have preached the gospel of the grace of God because he wasn't buried and rise again. Does that make sense? He's preaching the gospel of the kingdom. He's not saying believe on my death, burial and resurrection. He's walking around. He's got a kingdom gospel. That is being preached during his earthly ministry. Now watch though. What? How is that gospel of the kingdom confirmed? And healing all manner of sickness. And all manner of disease. Among the people. And what does he do in, in, in verse number 24? Sick people were taken with divers diseases and torments. Those that were possessed with devils. Those which were lunatic. And those that had the palsy. And he healed them. And I'm telling you, these fakers that say they have these healing gifts, it's a bunch of phony baloney. They are lying men. When we go out, we are not doing signs. If the Lord brings it about where we're able to do a nursing home ministry, it's a great ministry. And I've been involved in nursing home ministry. We go there. I am not laying my hands on some elderly person and trying to heal them of the palsy. Because that is not the gospel we preach. The gospel of the kingdom was good news. But it's confirmed by signs. Look at it again in Matthew 9. Matthew chapter 9. Verse number 35. Watch what Jesus did. Uh, Matthew 9, 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Same gospel he's preaching. And what's he doing? Healing every sickness and every disease among the people. If somebody tells us that they're sick and we meet him door knocking, what do we do? Try to heal them of their sickness? No. <laughs> We can add them to our prayer list. We could pray for them right now. Lord, give this person some comfort. Help the doctors to be able to figure out what's going on. Haven't we all prayed those prayers? Yeah. But we cannot miraculously heal them. If we were walking around with Jesus, we were one of the apostles, we would preach the gospel of the kingdom and we would have sign wonders uh, to be able to back up and confirm what we were saying. All right, last one. Let's do one in Luke, and then we'll move on to something else. Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter number 9, verse number 2. 
Uh, verse number one. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. Now, I got to admit to you, I read that verse. That'd be kind of cool to have. Wouldn't you like to have that one walking around town? You just be able to just knock out these devils. But watch what he does in verse two. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. We're not going out to heal the sick, guys. Is somebody sick spiritually with sin? We're going to offer them salvation and deliverance spiritually. That's what we're going to do. But we are not going to physically heal them through a sign miracle. Be cool to do. It's fun to think about. But we can't do it. Because we're not an apostle and we don't have a signed gift. Most people assume the gospel of the king of the kingdom that we just were talking about. We're continuing to talk about. They assume that it is the death, burial and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's just not. It's not what the Bible teaches concerning that gospel. Get Matthew four. Jesus starts preaching this gospel of the kingdom as early as Matthew chapter four. And look at verse number 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. And they were fishers. And he said unto them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And straightway they left their nets and followed him. Now, don't we preach that? Hey, we, we, we. We were trusting in this and we said, you know what? I'm trusting in Christ. And I'm following him. And I'm not preach. It preaches. I preach that. You understand that. But Jesus isn't preaching the death, burial and resurrection of himself in Matthew uh, four because, well, he's alive. <laughs> That's why. So. Let's keep reading and straight away. OK, so verse twenty one. And going on from thence, he saw older two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, John, his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. And preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria. Why? He was healing people. And they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with divers diseases and torments. We, you know, we read that and he took care of business because that's what Jesus does. What did Jesus and Jesus apostles preach when they traveled around? They didn't preach. What Jesus calls us to preach out there. They preached a kingdom gospel. Look at verse four. Look at verse 23. And preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness. We don't preach that. Let's see it. I know I'm reviewing it, but let's go to Matthew 9. Let's look at that again. Matthew 9 35. Watch what they preached. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. We don't preach that. That's what Jesus and his disciples preached during his earthly ministry. Matthew 11, 5. Was it good news? Yes. Was it, were they delivered? Yes. Is it the gospel that we preach today? No. Common definition, but we're honing in onto a specific context. Matthew eleven five. Uh, I guess I guess let's start at uh, three. And said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Jesus answered, said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight. 
I'm not healing a blind guy. And the lame walk. Go down to the nursing home and try to get that to happen. The lepers are cleansed. And the deaf hear. And the dead are raised up. And the poor have the gospel preached to them. What gospel? The gospel of the kingdom where there's healing and miracles and signs and wonders. Are you with me? Amen on that. Amen. You're following along. At least you, you. Okay. Matthew 10 in the beginning. Watch this. This is all kingdom of heaven stuff, guys. These 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received, freely give. And he goes on. They didn't preach the death, burial, and resurrection. None of them preached it. They haven't heard of it and they don't understand the death, burial, and resurrection. And they don't get it until after the gospel of the kingdom of heaven is preached. And they don't get it until after Jesus actually rose from the dead. I'm going to tell you where another assumption we get in trouble. We get in trouble when we assume that the men, the, the disciples that Jesus had, we get in trouble when we assume that they knew about or believed the death, burial, and resurrection while they were walking around with Jesus during his earthly ministry. Matthew 16. Look at Matthew 16. Matthew 16, get verse 21. Watch this. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples. Watch this. How that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Okay. Is that the gospel that we preach? Jesus going to rise again? Die on the sin, die, die on the cross for our sins. He's going to rise again three days, three days, and later. Watch what they say. Verse 22. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord. This shall not be unto thee. You know what Peter told him? Lord, you're not telling me right. That's not going to happen to you, Lord. I don't believe that. They didn't believe him. As soon as he started telling them about it, nah. Watch. It, it's, it doesn't stop there. Get uh, Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, verse number 31. For he's the uh, okay, let me try that again. For he taught his disciples and said unto them, watch this. The son of man is delivered in the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And after that he is killed, he shall rise the third day. Anybody want to guess what the rise from the third day is? That would be his resurrection. Watch what they say in verse 32. But they understood not that saying and were afraid to ask. Him. <laughs> How can it be any clearer? It's like when you witness to somebody. Jesus Christ paid for your sins. So you don't have to pay for them. He died on the cross. He was buried three days, three nights later. He rose again. I don't understand that. Okay. What is it that you don't understand? <laughs> Yet they didn't understand. They had no clue. Uh, Luke 9. Watch, watch it. Luke chapter 9. Luke 9, verse 44. Uh, Luke 9, 44. Let these sayings sink down into your ears. For the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. And their response again in verse 45. Watch. 
but they understood not this saying. And it was hid from them that they perceived it not. And they feared to ask him of that saying. They did not get it. Last one, Luke 18. Luke 18, verse number 34. Uh, let's back it up. 32. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated and spitted on. And they shall scourge him and put him to death. And the third day he shall rise again. That's Jesus speaking to them. Their, their belief on it was, verse 34, and they understood none of these things. And this saying was hid from them, neither knew they the things which were spoken. When people say that the disciples joyfully and wholeheartedly received the good news, that G when Jesus told them that he was going to be crucified and, in, and on the third day rise again, they did not joyfully receive that message. Peter rebuked God. And he said be, he did not believe Jesus Christ. To say that, we just deny what is clear in the scriptures. They did not understand and they didn't believe the death, burial, and resurrection until after Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Then they, they got it. Then the light switch went on. But during his whole earthly ministry, Kingdom of heaven gospel, kingdom of heaven gospel, kingdom of heaven gospel. He finally tells them, by the way, fellas, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to be mocked, spit it upon, scourge, and then three days later, I'm going to rise again. Nah, be it far from you, Lord. No way. They didn't believe him until when? After he rose from the dead. Then it clicked. They preached the gospel of the kingdom and they did not preach the death, burial and resurrection of the Lord until after he rose from the dead. Now watch in John. Watch in John. John chapter 20. Watch this. Verse 6, then cometh Simon Peter following him and went to the sepulcher and seeth the linen cloth lie and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also the other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. When did they believe? After he rose from the dead. Look at Ma uh, Mark. Look at Mark. Chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. Verse 13. And they went and told it under the residue. Neither believed they of them. Afterward, verse 14, he appeared unto the eleven as he sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart. Because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. Verse 15. Watch what they are commissioned to do now. And he said unto them. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not and is baptized not shall be damned. Except, oops, I read that one wrong. <laughs> because if you believe not, you're damned. Not if you don't get baptized, you're damned. All believers should be baptized, but you don't need to be baptized to be considered a born again Christian. Just to throw that one out there in case any church of Christ are listening, which aren't really the church of our Jesus Christ. They're the church of the Christ that they made up in their own mind, but it's not the God of the Bible. Because water baptism doesn't save you. Right. 
Jesus Christ saves you. And they were commissioned now to preach that gospel. In Mark chapter 16, Jesus did not commission them to go and preach the kingdom of heaven and heal people and do the miracles and heal the palsy and the lame and the blind. The message now shifts after the resurrection. And it's a different gospel. It's good news. It's glad tidings. It means the salvation is to be delivered. But now it is a salvation spiritually that they are preaching. It's a turn away from this kingdom gospel. Um, all right, let's do John because there's one in John too. Watch this. We're already in John, but I missed verse 25. So let's go back there. John 20. Sorry, we got to flip back. But John 25, John 20, verse 25. Uh, let me see. I might have the wrong. I might have wrote, wrote down the wrong verse. Sorry. Okay, scratch that idea. Um, but I do want to go to Acts one. I want to. I want you to see. I want to see something in Acts one. Watch. I think. I think we're good here. Acts chapter one. Uh, verse number 22. Watch this. Beginning from the baptism of John under the same day that he was taken up from us. One must uh, must one be ordained to be a witness of his resurrection. Do you know why the sign wanders and sign gifts went out? Because the apostles went out. Do you know how you could be an apostle? You see that in Acts 122? You have to be a witness of the resurrected Christ. That's Acts 122. The gospel of the kingdom was confirmed by what? Signs and wonders. Jesus is healing people. His apostles were given those sign gifts. To confirm this message or this gospel of the kingdom. Are any of the apostles alive now? Nobody is going around doing apostolic sign miracles. Can God still do miracles? I believe he can. But this idea is I'm an apostle. It went out. That message of the kingdom of heaven that Jesus preached during his earthly ministry with his apostles while they were healing people is out. God commissions them to something else. And it's a shift from an earthly and promised kingdom to a heavenly and spiritual kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is not the gospel to be preached by New Testament Christians. Mm -hmm.